Hello, welcome to Living Hope Church Online, brought to you by Living Hope Church Broadcast Media. I am your host, Pastor Dr. Kemi Atanda Ilori, the General Overseer of Living Hope Church. Today, Thursday, the 28th of June, 2024, I am grateful to God that we can continue our series on the good news of Jesus, the good news of Jesus. The topic today is, what do you want God to do for you? The good news of Jesus, what do you want God to do for you? Today's broadcast is based on three occasions in the Bible when Jesus asks the people that approached him for help, what do you want me to do for you? You will see this in Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 40. This is the time when the sons of Zebedee, James and John, approached Jesus. And they said, we would like you to do something for us. And Jesus said to them, what do you want me to do for you? Another instance is in Matthew chapter 20, verses 39 to 34. Here, two blind men received their sight as Jesus and his disciples and a great multitude were going out of Jericho, two blind men cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. And although everybody warned the two blind men to keep quiet, they didn't keep quiet. They kept shouting all the more. So Jesus stood still and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? The third final instance is found in Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. Mark 10, verses 46 to 52. Here, a particular blind man named Bartimaeus is involved. As Jesus was going out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, who sat by the road begging, began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And although many people want him to keep quiet, like with the two blind men that we read about earlier, Bartimaeus did not keep quiet. So Jesus stopped and said, Go and call him and bring him to me. So everybody that was near to Bartimaeus said to him, Be of good cheer. Rise, he is calling you. So Bartimaeus threw aside his garment. He rose and went to Jesus. So Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to Jesus, Rabboni that I may receive my sight, or teacher, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. So the question to ask ourselves is this, does Jesus not know what these people want before they ask? What is your answer? Does Jesus not know what these people want before they ask? Of course, he does. Of course, he does. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 8, Jesus warned us not to be praying like unbelievers who used so many words and so many repetitions. And in verse 8, Jesus says, For your father 
knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 to 33, Jesus speaks to all of us. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. The question now is, why does God want us to tell him what we want him to do for us? Why does God want us to tell him what we want him to do for us? In today's broadcast, we will tackle this important question. But guess what? We will also tackle two other questions. What are the two other questions that we will tackle in today's broadcast? What obstacles or problems must we overcome to enjoy telling God what we want him to do for us? What obstacles or problems must we overcome to enjoy telling God what we want him to do for us? It is very clear to me that if we deal with those problems or obstacles, we will see more astonishing answers to our prayers. The third question we will deal with in today's broadcast is, why is God always so good to us in Christ Jesus? Why is God always so good to us in Christ Jesus? I am sure if we know the most important things about God in Christ Jesus, we will never doubt again when we pray. So, let's go. Let's go and tackle the first question. Why does God want us to tell him what we want him to do for us? Firstly, it's a matter of bona fide relationship. It's a matter of bona fide relationship. Some people will pronounce it bona fide, but actually it is bona fide. When something is bona fide, it is authentic, genuine, real, true, actual. Therefore, God wants us to tell him what we want him to do for us. If we certainly know that because of Jesus Christ, our relationship with God is sound, legal, legitimate, proper. If we know that in Christ Jesus, our relationship with God is indeed fair and square. God is indeed our Heavenly Father because we are in Christ Jesus. We will always tell God what we want him to do for us without any fear or hesitation because it is a matter of bona fide relationship. I know some people will pronounce it as bona fide, but the pronunciation is bona fide, bona fide relationship. There is no other relationship that we can have that will ever compare with our relationship with God in Christ Jesus. Telling God what we want him to do for us is because our relationship with him is authentic. Our relationship with him is genuine. Our relationship with him is real. Our relationship with him is actual. I know this, I found that out over many years now. Our relationship with God through Christ Jesus is honest to goodness. Is honest to goodness. It is legit. It is on the level. It is the real McCoy. 
Come with me to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. The Lord Jesus was teaching his disciples and now us how to pray. The Lord Jesus says, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven. There is only one person in the history of mankind who links us to God as our Father. That person is the Lord Jesus Christ. He has the right and the authority to link us to God as our Heavenly Father because Jesus himself is the beloved Son of God and he died so that we could be reconciled to God so that in him God would have us back. In Adam and Eve, God lost the people that he loved so much because Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. You want to read that story again in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve lost the wonderful relationship that they had with God. They lost the Garden of Eden. They were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. They lost everlasting life. Thank God that in Christ Jesus, the Son of God, God took the initiative to bring us back to himself. All the things that Adam and Eve lost, we gained much more. Through Christ Jesus, we indeed now have God as our Heavenly Father. That relationship is so genuine, so sound, so real, so true, so actual, so legit. It is the real McCoy, the real thing. Amen. It's fair and square. When you know God as your heavenly father, my goodness, you will want to tell him what you want him to do for you. In John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Can you begin to see why you will want to tell God what you want him to do for you? Because in Christ Jesus, God has come to make his home with you through his blessed Holy Spirit. You will know when this has happened. Nobody needs to preach this to you. You will know. It is something that you will know. It will be practical in your life. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. How? By the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. That's why God wants us to tell him what we want him to do for us. It's a matter of what? Of bona fide relationship in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1. From verse 3 to 6, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We are accepted in the Beloved. We are accepted in the Beloved. God indeed is our heavenly Father. In John chapter 20, verse 17, Jesus said to Mary Magdalene, do not cling to me, for I have not ascended, I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brothers and sisters and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, and to my God and your God. Wow. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit speak something to your heart today. If you are not yet born again, would you please give your life to Christ Jesus? Because when we are born again, surely, certainly, God is our Heavenly Father. And it is practical. It is what we know in our experience, day to day, moment by moment. Ask me, I know what I'm talking about. Why does God want us to tell him what we want him to do for us? 
Another reason is it's a matter of bona fide trust. It's a matter of bona fide trust. I know some people will pronounce it as bona fide, but it is bona fide. It's a matter of bona fide trust. Let us admit this thing. Trusting God is always the most difficult part of our relationship with God. I know that personally. Trusting God is always the most difficult part of our relationship with God. Our heart usually cries out that we trust him, but our head is full of instances when we prayed and things did not happen the way we prayed for. We have instances when we believe God has failed us, when we believe as a father, he didn't answer us the way we were expecting. So usually our heart will say, mm, I trust God, but our head will be reminding us, what about that time and that other time when you prayed and nothing happened or something happened contrary to your prayer? What did your heavenly father do then? Do you think you can still trust him in this matter? That when you tell him what you want him to do for you, he will do it? You see, our head tells us all the time, God's ways are higher than our ways. Isaiah 55 verses 8 to 9. Our head tells us all the time, God always does as he pleases. The sovereignty of God. God always does as he pleases. Psalm 115 verse 3. Our head tells us, who really can tell God what to do? Who can instruct him? Isaiah chapter 40 verses 13 to 14. But this is what we notice throughout the Bible. Despite these instances, we see that God wants us to tell him what we want him to do for us. Despite the instances in the Bible, in our life, when we prayed and nothing happened, or when we prayed and things happened contrary to our prayers. Instances when we felt, where was God? Instances when we felt, we prayed, but God refused to answer and do for us what we wanted him to do for us. In spite of all those instances, see what God says in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 12 to 14. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you. So despite whatever instances, when we prayed and God didn't do what we had requested of him, when we prayed and God did the exact opposite or permitted the exact opposite to happen and we were pained and we were disappointed and we were saying, what kind of father is this? Despite that, despite such instances, God says in Jeremiah, Chapter 29, verses 12 to 14. You will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me. When you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you. In Psalm 145, verse 19, the Bible says, God will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He also will hear their cry and save them. So despite whatever instances of failed prayers, the Bible makes it abundantly clear. God will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He also will hear their cry and save them. So you see, throughout the Bible, God actually wants us to tell him what we want him to do for us. 
Yes, I've had instances when I've prayed and nothing has happened for a long, long time. Or when I've prayed and the opposite has happened. To my sorrow, to my disappointment. But let me tell you something. I've got so many, many instances of when I've prayed and God in his mercy has done exactly as I had prayed. Many, many instances. I'm overwhelmed by the kindnesses of God. I'm overwhelmed by the goodnesses of God. In fact, there are times when I was yet to pray and God anticipated my need and he answered the prayer that I had not even prayed. Many instances. Throughout the Bible, God wants us to tell him what we want him to do for us. He really hears our cries. He really hears our prayers. A vast majority of prayers answered by God in the Bible are exactly what people prayed for. A vast majority of prayers answered by God in the Bible are exactly what people prayed for. That's my experience too. That's why I will never allow any instance of unanswered prayers or prayers that God answered strangely in an opposite direction and it gave me sorrow or pain or frustration or disappointment. I will never allow those instances to overwhelm me because they are so few and far between. They are so few and far between. Look at what the Bible tells us. Isaiah 65 verse 24. This is the Lord God speaking here. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. That is mostly true about God because of our relationship with him. And that relationship is a matter of trust bona fide trust. You have to trust God. Don't let your trust decline. Don't let your trust diminish. Don't let your trust lead you to a place where your faith is so little, if you have faith at all. Look at Isaiah chapter 30, verse 19. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. God will be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. When he hears it, he will answer you. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 11, which I know most of us, we can remember very well. Ask, it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to whom who knocks it will be opened. And it goes on to say, if you as a bad father, you know how to give good things to your children, how much more God, who is a very, very good father. Amen. Amen. The Lord is good. So, what we find is that despite all of these assurances, on many occasions in our life, trusting God is still always the most difficult part of our relationship with God. Despite all these assurances, we are most likely to remember when we prayed and nothing happened, or when we prayed and the opposite happened to our sorrow, to our disappointment. I want to encourage you, focus on the assurances. You'll be overwhelmed by many more prayers that God answers exactly as you have prayed. Exactly as you have prayed. So when my heart cries out that I trust him and my head is reminding me of instances when things have not happened as I had prayed, I say to my head, Sit down quietly. It is my heart that rules. It is the heart in which you trust God. 
It is with the heart that you trust God. Don't let your trust in God decline. Don't let your trust in God diminish. Stand tall, stand firm. God wants us to tell him what we want him to do for us because it's a matter of genuine trust, real trust, sound trust in his superabundant goodness towards us every day, every moment, in every situation. So my prayer is that may God grant us the grace to ignore any unanswered prayers and to gladly rush to tell God every time what we want him to do for us. Let me go to the third answer. Why does God want us to tell him what we want him to do for us? The third and final answer is a matter of basic obedience. It's a matter of basic obedience. God commands us to pray to him. You can't read the Bible for, for a few times before you notice that God requires us to pray to him. It's a sign of our relationship with God. It's a sign of our dependency upon God. Go to that soul that says they have nothing to pray to God about. Go to that soul that says they have no need of God. Go to that soul that says there is no God. It doesn't matter. They will do whatever they want to do. Their money will answer them. Go to that soul that doesn't know to pray to God. Go to that soul. Remember what the Bible says in Mark chapter 8, verses 36 to 37. Let us imagine that a man gains the whole world. What will it profit him? What can he exchange for his own soul? A day is going to come and he's going to vanish from the face of the earth. He's going to die. He can't take anything away with him. All his money, all his wealth, all his power, everything that he thinks so much about that consumed his time, that made him to believe that God doesn't exist. And he puts his trust in those idols of his heart. When the time comes and he, and he dies, the Bible says, what will he exchange for his soul? even if he gains the whole world. Throughout the Bible, God shows us that without him, we are nothing. We are dependent creatures. God is completely independent. God doesn't need any one of us. He created us out of his abundant love, out of his mysterious love. And Blessed be that soul that recognizes their dependency upon God. God commands us to pray. It's a matter of basic obedience. When we rush to tell God what we want him to do for us. Psalm 91 verses 15 to 16. God is speaking here. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. May there be God's voice ringing steadily in your ears. May that be God's voice ringing steadily in your mind, because that is the voice of God in my heart. He shall call upon me. It's a command, and I will answer him. Kemi shall call upon me, and I will answer Kemi. I will be with Kemi in trouble. I will deliver Kemi. I will honor Kemi. With long life, I will satisfy Kemi. I will show Kemi my salvation. God commands me to pray, to call upon him. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3. God told Jeremiah, call to me. It's a command. 
and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Matthew 11, verses 28 to 29. Come to me. It's a command. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's a command. Actually, we have no relationship with God if we have problem obeying him. If you have problem obeying God, you have no relationship with God. Telling God what we want him to do for us is actually a matter of simple obedience. It is basic obedience. When we fail to tell God what we want him to do for us, we have failed the most basic aspect of our relationship with God. When you fail to pray, you have actually prayed to fail. <laughs> when you fail to pray sincerely, genuinely, you have actually prayed to fail. Telling God what we want him to do for us is a matter of basic obedience. And remember, God always rewards obedience. God always rewards obedience. Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the heart is mine. God requires our obedience. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 to 2, you see how God begins to pronounce blessings on the obedience of God's people. If you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, I will set you above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. So you see, throughout the Bible, God makes it abundantly clear that we must tell him what we want him to do for us. Prayer is a necessary part of our relationship with God. The Bible is filled with the prayers of God's people in obedience to his instructions that we must tell him what we want him to do for us. See Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 7. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 7. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us for whatever reason we may call upon him? When we are born again in Christ Jesus, this is so true for us. We may call upon him for whatever need that we have. What great nation, what great people is there that ask God so near to them, like people who are born again in Christ Jesus? Second Samuel chapter 22, verse 4. This is what the psalmist David has to say. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Now that we know why God wants us to tell him what we want him to do for us, I'm sure we will pray more confidently. Now that you know, we've given three reasons why God wants us to tell us what we want him to do for us. We've given three reasons. It's a matter of bona fide relationship. It's a matter of bona fide trust. It's a matter of simple obedience. If you get those three reasons, you will pray more confidently to God. Let's go to the second question that we want to tackle in today's broadcast. What obstacles or problems must we overcome to enjoy telling God what we want him to do for us? What problems must we overcome in our relationship with God, in our day-to-day -day life? 
what problems or obstacles must we overcome in order to enjoy telling God what we want him to do for us? First one, we must overcome the problem of trust. You know why I mentioned that in the earlier part of this broadcast. The trust question is at the root of a lot of our issues with God. The trust question is linked to faith. The trust question is at the root of a lot of our issues with God. Because somewhere along the line, for all of us, God didn't live up to our expectations. Somewhere along the line, for all of us, God didn't do what we wanted him to do. We discovered that God is not a magician. We discovered that God is not our servant. Sit down, God. Stand up, God. Go and get my grocery, God. Do this for me, God. Do that for me, God. The time comes when we discover that we cannot manipulate God. We cannot emotionally blackmail him. And that brings about the issue of trust unnecessarily. So we must overcome the problem of trust. Because you see, at the back of our mind, every time we are praying to God, we lack absolute trust that God will do what we want him to do for us. At the back of our mind, every time we are praying to God, we lack absolute trust that God will do what we are asking him to do for us. Sometimes we misapply the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? Jesus said, Lord, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So we use Jesus' prayer as a kind of cop out. But Jesus has absolute trust in his Father. He has absolute trust. Whereas we, when we use that particular phrase, Lord, uh, answer me if it's according to your will, is because we lack absolute trust in God. We forget that the usual prayer position of Jesus is that God will always answer him according to what he is requesting. That is the usual position of Jesus. Remember John 11, verses 40 to 42, when Jesus went to visit the sisters of Lazarus, Mary and Martha. Lazarus had died. And so Jesus said, okay, Lazarus will rise again. And one of the sisters said, I know he will rise again at the end. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I'm the life and the resurrection. Anyone who trusts in me, even though they die, they will live. And if they live, they will not die. So Jesus was going to the tomb. And Martha said, Lord Jesus, the man has been dead for four days. There is a stench now. You are telling us to roll away the stone that covers the tomb. So what did Jesus say to her? Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you will see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. I know that you always hear me, because, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. The usual prayer posture of Jesus is that God always hears him. He tells God what he wants God to do for him. And that should be the same thing with us. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit help me to overcome the problem of trust when it arises in my prayer life. When there is a big situation that I'm thinking, oh, this is a big situation. I don't think God will deal with this. May God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, 
grant me the grace to know that my position in terms of prayer always is that God always hears me. In Mark chapter 11, verses 22 to 24, Jesus says to us, not to doubt at all. Whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Let your prayer posture towards God always be, I know you always hear me, Father. Leave the rest in his hands. Pray confidently. When your trust declines, your faith vanishes. The problem of trust is at the root of all our issues with God. Overcome that problem today by the grace of God. See First John chapter 5, verses 14 to 15. The Bible says this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. We will overcome the problem of trust when we are absolutely confident that God hears us. If we want to enjoy telling God what we want him to do for us, the second problem that we must overcome is the problem of discernment. Remember what we have just read in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 to 15. It says, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We need the discernment to know we are asking according to his will. Always, always that we are asking according to his will. A lot of people will say that is the difficult area in their relationship with God. They are thinking, oh, how will I know that what I want to ask is in accordance with the will of God for me or for my life? Once you start asking yourself that question, I think you have lost it. I think you must come to a place where you say, whatever is good in my sight for me, I must ask God to do it for me. I must trust that if it is good in my sight, if it, this thing is good for me, then I should have the confidence to ask and leave the rest in the hands of God. Don't do self-censorship. A lot of people, they delete their prayers even before they pray those prayers. They already delete them. They have no confidence that God wants the best for them. They are thinking time has passed. They are looking at their age. They are looking at their qualifications. They are looking at people who are out there, who are doing very well, and they don't even pray to God. And whatever they want to pray for, these people who don't even go to church, who don't even pray to God, they are basking in them. They are enjoying them. I'm praying that God will help someone today. The problem of discernment, you must overcome it. Don't delete your prayers even before you pray them. Don't do so much self-censorship that you are constantly thinking, shall I pray this prayer? Shall I not pray this prayer? Shall I ask God to do this? Shall I not ask God to do this? You are in a topsy-toffy situation then. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit just give you this wonderful grace to be able to discern that what you are asking for is actually good for you. And if it is not good for you, God knows the best. He will give you the best that is good for you. Amen. That's how you start. That's how I start. That's what I do with all my prayers. So it's the problem of discernment that James, in his epistle, the epistle of James was dealing with. In James chapter 4, verse 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. As soon as somebody reads that, they're asking, can I ask God to buy me the best tie, the best shirt, the best shoes, to get me the best job? Will it not mean I'm spending it on my pleasures? No, no, not at all. 
not at all. You see, when a person is still in the world, then they think like the world, they act like the world. But when a person is in the Lord, then whatever they want to ask, they are asking in the Lord. Amen. So my first question to you is, are you born again? If you are born again, you will know. You will be in the world, but you will not be of the world. You will not ask for anything because you want to be like the people of the world. Amen. See, in Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 40, when the two brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, when they went to Jesus saying, we want to see it on your right hand and on your left hand. Now, there are other apostles there. There are 12 of them. And these people, they want to corner the right hand and the left hand. They weren't thinking of other people. That was the problem with discernment. And that is the same kind of problem that a lot of people would have when they are not born again. When they are not born again, they lack discernment to say, wow, am I actually acting like a child of God? Am I requesting this as a child of God? Or am I just doing this because I'm in the world and I'm attracted by the things of the world and I'm following the things of the world? So it's important for us to overcome the problem of discernment. Time is far gone. Problem number three that we have to overcome, the problem of values. The problem of values. Come to Luke 9, Luke chapter 9, verses 49 to 50. What are the values that are driving your life now? I'm grateful to God. I can surely let you know that God in his mercy has brought me up, has trained me, and I'm still learning that the value that must drive my life are what? Are spiritual values, values that matter to God, loving God exclusively, loving people selflessly, doing everything because I want to please God. Even if I get it wrong, at least God knows that I really wanted to please him. The desire of my heart every day now is to please God. The only way that desire is there is because of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who motivates me and who will motivate you to want to please God in everything that you do. We are not perfect, but the Holy Spirit will be perfect in us day by day, moment by moment, from one occasion to another. The values that drive you are the values that will make you to pray for certain things that you want God to do for you. So what are your values? What is the source of your values? Is it your culture? Is it your government? Is it your family? Is it your neighborhood? Is it social media? Is it from WhatsApp? Is it from TikTok and Instagram? What are the values that are driving you in the way you dress, in the places you go, in what you eat, what you drink, what you smoke, what you wear, how you look, the job that you do, how you do that job, what are the values that are driving you? The two values that God recommends to us, one, love God with all your heart. Seek to please him in everything that you do. Two, love people selflessly. Let those two values drive you. And then you will know when you pray, the things you'll be asking for will normally be in the will of God for your life. The problem of values. So Luke chapter 9, verses 49 to 50. You know how they came to Jesus. John said to Jesus, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not forbid him for he who is not against us is on our side. You know, John was very sectarian, very divisive, very separating, very judgmental. Jesus has to train him. May Jesus train you too in what you say in how you lead, 
in how you act in certain situations, you know, may God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit teach you. It is the value that is driving you that will show up in what you say, in how you behave, in what you do. Look at another one, Luke chapter 9, the same chapter 9, verses 51 to 56. A Samaritan village rejects the Lord Jesus. And then two of his disciples say, they say to Jesus, let's call out fire to destroy them. And Jesus says, no, you don't know the kind of spirit you are made of. The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. In the church, you will see people who want to destroy everything. When they leave the church, they want to destroy the church. You'll see people, when they are unhappy with you, then they want to destroy you. It is because the values that are ruling in their life are satanic values, are worldly values, are competitive values, the values of me, myself, and I alone, selfish values. You must ask yourself, how is your life being run? According to what values? According to what values? Because the values that are running your life we also dictate what you pray for, what you want God to do for you. So overcome the problem of values. And you will be rushing to tell God what you want him to do for you. Another problem that we have to overcome is the problem of doubting. The problem of doubting. You see, doubting is something that we all do, especially when we look at the problem from the perspective of our little mind, limited knowledge, limited strength, limited resources, you want to pay school fees and you know you don't have the school fees. You are looking at people who are building houses or buying land and you know you don't have the resources. Then you start doubting because the problem of doubting comes when we are looking at our problems from the perspective of our limited knowledge, limited resources, limited strength, and it translates into limited faith in God. We start doubting. A man or woman that focuses on what limitations they have will always doubt God. Every man, every woman, that focuses on their own perspective in dealing with their problems, they will always doubt God. Doubting comes when you shift your perspective from God to yourself, to man, to woman, to your parents, to your children, to your pastors, to your general overseer. Once you shift your perspective from the limitless goodness of God, to the very limited goodness of man or woman, you will start doubting. That's why I say, by the grace of God, I don't put my trust or my hope in anyone. Every need that I have, I express it to God. And in that way, God makes me to grow in my faith, in my certainty that God is there and that God will do what I want him to do for me in the name of Jesus. So overcome the problem of doubting. Matthew chapter 14, verses 27 to 32. You see how Jesus tells his disciples, be of good cheer. It is I, do not be afraid. And then Peter says, if it is you, master, bid me to come and walk on the water like you. And Jesus said to Peter, okay, come on. And Peter stepped out of the boat. At least he had more faith than the other disciples who were cowering in the boat and, and full of fear. So Peter stepped out of the boat and he started walking on the water. But then he shifted his perspective from Jesus. He shifted his gaze onto the roar of the waves, to the fi fiery sands, the troubling sands, 
the opera of the sea, he looked away from Jesus. He looked to the problem with his own perspective and he began to sink. And then he cried out to Jesus, Master, I am sinking, please save me. And Jesus stretched out his hand and saved him. And you know what Jesus told him? Why did you doubt? Why are you troubled? Why are you troubled? Why did you doubt? Anytime you are troubled, remember you are likely to doubt. So shift your perspective to God. Shift your perspective from your own limited knowledge, your own limited resources, your own limited abilities. Shift your perspective to God and say, with God, all things are possible. I'm going to depend on God for this. In Romans chapter 14, verse 23, the Bible says, He who doubts is condemned. He who doubts is condemned because he does not do whatever he wants to do from faith. He's already doubting. He's already doubting. He who doubts is condemned. So we must overcome the problem of doubt. The person who will rush to tell God what they want God to do for them is a person that overcomes the problem of doubting, a person that is sure. Like a child, when they are sure of their parent, they will rush and say, Mama, buy me an aeroplane. <laughs> Mama, buy me the biggest car. Mama, buy me the biggest house. Mama, buy me the biggest toy. They are not doubting. They have shifted from their own perspective of being a child to the perspective of their parent, what the parent can do is what matters to them. It's the same way that God in his mercy has helped me. He shifts my perspective from myself, from all of you, from the government of the day, from the country I'm living in. God shifts my perspective to himself. With God, all things are possible. So by the grace of God, the Lord makes me to overcome doubting. It's not that I don't doubt, but often God in his mercy rescues me from doubting because he has fixed my perspective on him and not on myself and not on anyone else. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have to go on quickly. See James chapter 1 from verse 5 to 6. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. God gives to all liberally and without reproach. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Driven and tossed by the wind. May God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, make you to overcome the problem of doubting. The final problem that we must overcome if we are going to be rushing out to gladly tell God what we want him to do for us, to gladly tell him and say, Father, this is what I would like you to do for me in this particular situation. The final problem we have to overcome is the problem of the world, is the problem of the world. A lot of us, without knowing it, we are copycats of the world. We are copycats of the world. We look at what the world is doing and we want what the world has got. We want it. We want the fashion, the latest fashion. We want the latest jewelry. We look at TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. We look at social media. We see what people are doing, the cars they are riding, the clothes they are wearing, the holidays they are going to. And we want to be like them. You know, sometimes I just say, my God. Some people that I think that they are born again, I see them on social media and I say, wow. They are in the world. They are of the world. They want the things of the world. See the example in First Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 to 6. First Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 to 6. All the elders of Israel, they gathered together. They went to Samuel. They said, Samuel, 
We want a king like the older nations of the world. We want we don't want God to rule directly over us again. We also want a king now. It made Samuel very sad. It displeased him. The same thing happens in the life of so many people. They want the glam glam. They want the glamour. They want what the world has got. Well, if you want what the world has got, you will have to go to the world to get it. And if you want what the world has got, you will probably perish with what the world has got. Look around you. Everyone that goes for what the world has got, they also perish with what the world has got. That's why in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, the Bible says to us, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Don't let your prayers to God be driven by the lusts of the world. When you are born again, you will know because you will be in the world, but will not be of the world. The things of the world will not be paramount in your life. The desires of the world will not be paramount in your life. You will just see that you don't thirst after the things of the world. Of course, we are still in the world. We need nice clothes. We are still in the world. We can buy a car. We can build houses. Of course, we can get a good job. Of course, we should succeed in life. But we are not running the rat race of the world. We are not competing with anybody. We are not looking at the fashion that somebody has had on and we are saying, oh, look at her. I want that clothes. No, we are not like that. Our eyes are fixed on the Lord. We have to finish. Let's go to the third and final question of today's broadcast. The third and final question of today's broadcast. We can see that when we deal with the problems, all those problems, those five problems, we will see more astonishing answers to our prayers when we deal with those five problems. We will see more astonishing answers to our prayers. Final question that we want to tackle in today's broadcast. Why is God always so good to us in Christ Jesus? Why do you hear me saying, Lord, I thank you for your marvelous goodness towards us in Christ Jesus. Nearly every time, every moment, I'm so grateful to God for his marvelous goodness towards us in Christ Jesus. And that is one reason why I rush gladly to tell God what I want God to do for me. What are the three most important things about God in Christ Jesus? that will make you to always want to go quickly to God, to tell God what you want God to do for you. The three most important things. One, mercy. Two, compassion. Three, grace. The good news of Jesus is underpinned by God's mercy, God's compassion, and God's grace. Read the good news of Jesus in the gospel according to Matthew, to Mark, to Luke, and to John. And then you will see the good news of Jesus is underpinned by what? By God's mercy, God's compassion, and God's grace. Let's start with mercy. Look at Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 12. Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 12. The Lord Jesus called Matthew the tax collector. And Matthew gave a, a feast for Jesus. 
So when Jesus was at the house of Matthew, the tax collector, so many tax collectors who were regarded as sinners and other people who were regarded as sinners in the society, they were all sitting around Jesus. And those Pharisees who considered themselves to be righteous, they started complaining. If Jesus is a righteous person, why is he sitting with sinners? Why is he eating and drinking with sinners? Matthew chapter 9, verse 12, when Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And Jesus says to them, go and learn this. I require mercy, not sacrifice. I require mercy, not sacrifice. You'll find the same story in Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. And Luke chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. I require mercy, not sacrifice. When your life is in the good news of Jesus, you will understand that God's mercy is operating in your life. God's mercy is operating in your life. You can't be born again except by the mercy of God. Every moment of your life is operated under the mercy of God. Matthew chapter 15, verse 22 a woman of Canaan came and cried out to Jesus, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord. Have mercy on me. Our life is ruled by the mercy of God in Christ Jesus. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 15, A father came, Have mercy on my son. Have mercy. In Matthew chapter 20, verse, verse 30, Two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. In Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 14, 10 lepers, they came crying out to Jesus, have mercy on us, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. Jesus had mercy on them. The most important thing about the character of God in Christ Jesus is mercy. In fact, in the Old Testament, when the Lord required them to build a tabernacle for him, he said, build an ark in that tabernacle. And in that ark, place, place a seat there and call it the seat of mercy or the throne of mercy. And that's why in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, the Bible says, let us come to God quickly to his throne of mercy, so that we can have mercy in the time of need. We can have grace. The most important trait of God in Christ Jesus is his mercy. When you know about the mercy of God, you will never be afraid to tell God what you want God to do for you. When you know you are in Christ Jesus, the most important characteristic of God in Christ Jesus is his mercy. Mercy, mercy, mercy. The second most important characteristic of God in Christ Jesus is his compassion. Compassion is very close to mercy. In Mark chapter 1, verses 40 to 41, a leper came to Jesus, kneeling down and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. The second most important attribute of God in Christ Jesus is compassion. No matter how many times you think you've prayed and God did not answer, for God answered you opposite to what you had prayed for, you will have abundant instances of the compassion of God in your life when God did exactly what you asked God to do for you, ask me, that's the joy of my life. I'm in the kingdom of God. I'm in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second most important characteristic of God in Christ Jesus is compassion. God is very compassionate. 
is very compassionate towards me. Very, very compassionate towards me. That's why I always gladly go to God to tell him what I want him to do for me. Look at Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 36. Jesus was going about all the cities, teaching in the synagogues, teaching in the synagogues, preaching in the villages, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Why? Because he was moved with compassion for them. He was moved with compassion. Compassion is the second most important characteristic of God. He has compassion. He says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 32, Jesus fed the 4,000 out of compassion. In Mark 5, verses 18 to 19, Mark 5, verses 18 to 19, the demon possessed person whom Jesus had cured, begged Jesus, let me come with you. But Jesus did not permit him. But Jesus said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. God has done great things for me because he has had compassion on me. Now, every time, any time, I so gladly rush to tell God what I want him to do for me because I know he's a merciful God. He's compassionate. The third most important thing about the character of God in Christ Jesus is his grace, unmerited favor. The unmerited favor that God bestows upon us. Why would you not go quickly and tell God what you want him to do for you when you know that he gives unmerited favor? Grace means unmerited favor. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verses 16 to 17, that grace comes through Jesus, and through him we have received grace upon grace. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 9, the Bible says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 to 10, the Bible lists all the things with God through the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Grace, grace, and more grace, unmerited favor, always pushes me quickly to God to tell him what I would want him to do for me. Amen. Unmerited favor that God has shown me time and time again. How many things am I going to share with you? I'm just grateful to God that in today's broadcast, God is encouraging you and asking you, what do you want me to do for you? Ephesians 1, 7 to 10, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abandon toward us in Christ Jesus. I have to finish because time is far gone. Today we have considered the good news of Jesus and that God wants us to tell him what we want him to do for us. Today's broadcast has been based on those three occasions in the Bible when Jesus asked the people that approach him for help, what do you want me to do for you? Now we know why God wants us to tell him what we want him to do for us. Now we can pray more confidently. We have discussed the problems that we normally face, which often prevent us from telling God what we want him to do for us. Today in this broadcast, we know by overcoming those problems, we will see more astonishing answers to our prayers. Finally, we have dealt with the three most important character traits about God in his relationship with us in Christ Jesus. The three most important things about God in his relationship with us in Christ Jesus. 
mercy, compassion, and grace. Clearly, when we know God for who he is in Christ Jesus towards us, we should never doubt again when we pray. Amen. That is where we are stopping. Let me just read Sephaniah chapter 3, verse 17 as we close. Sephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Amen. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Amen. That's where we finish. I know it's been a long broadcast, but I hope that God has spoken to you. God has certainly spoken to me. I'm grateful to God that God asks me, Kemi, what do you want me to do for you? Thank you so much for watching this broadcast. Thank you for listening to this broadcast. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit bless you. Until another opportunity, until another opportunity on this platform, I am your host, Pastor Dr. Kemi Atanda Ilori, the General Overseer of Living Hope Church. Thank you so much. God loves you. I love you, but God loves you much, much more. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye.